Well, we're looking at the crash site. Chapter 3 of Genesis is where humanity in Adam and Eve crashed and uh, were utterly fallen from what God intended. And, and we're looking at that this week. Specifically, we're going to look this morning at Satan's lies, his flaws, the, the, the false statements he tried to get Adam and Eve to succumb to, and they did. And this morning, we're only going to look at basically the first one, which is doubting God's word. And I want you just in your mind as I'm going through this Paradise Lost uh, series to think about the event that happened back in the Garden of Eden, but then think about what it is doing in my life today. And I guess the real question I'm telling you is, do you doubt God's word this morning? Actively or passively, are you doubting God's word? Let's look at Genesis 3. We'll read it in just a moment. Because this morning, each of us present in this room is fallen. That means we live with the tragic results of the fall of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden back at the beginning of human history. To illustrate that, I'd like to read a little transcript segment of uh, a 60 Minutes television show. Because a few years ago, on the television show 60 Minutes, uh, the host, Mike Wallace, then interviewed one of the concentration camp survivors, uh, one of the worst of all the German uh, gas oven terrible death camps was called Auschwitz. And there was a survivor that was interviewed on television by the name of Yehiel Denur. He was a Jewish man who had been uh, not only a survivor of the Holocaust, but also he was the principal witness at the Nuremberg war criminal trials when Adolf Eichmann, who was over all the death camps, was tried in 1961. And so this Yehiel Denur Jewish fella, was the, the witness against Eichmann, which, of course, led to his conviction. And what Wallace did was, he opened the 60 Minutes with a film clip from the trial. And in this film clip, this Yehiel Denur walks into the courtroom, you know, uh, heavily guarded, and over there is, is sitting uh, Adolf Eichmann, you know, uh, this hardened Nazi war criminal. And when Yehiel Denur walks in the room, the film clip shows him walking in, and as soon as his eyes hit Eichmann, it says that he just breaks out into an uncontrollable sobbing and collapses on the floor. So Wallace showed that film clip on TV, and then he starts talking to this Yehul Denur. And he says to him, he says, uh, What's, what was it was going on in your mind when you collapsed? Were you overcome by hatred of Eichmann? Were you afraid of him? Did you have awful memories of the gas ovens and everything? And what I'd like to read to you is his response, because I think it illustrates the crash site of humanity. Denur answered, no, it was not hatred. It was not fear, nor was it the horrible memories of Auschwitz. Rather, I realized as I saw him sitting there that Adolf Eichmann was not the godlike army officer who had sent so many people to their deaths. When I saw him sitting there, I saw that he was just an ordinary man. But now listen, I was afraid about myself. I collapsed when I looked at him and I saw that I, Yehiel Denur, was capable of doing the same thing. I am exactly like him. In fact, he said, I discovered that there is an Eichmann in all of us. Now, let's talk about that was the television show. What does that mean? That's a horrifying statement, but it was so true. An unbelieving pagan Jewish survivor of Auschwitz came out with exactly what the word of God says. The Bible tells us, horrifyingly enough, that the central truth of our nature is that as a result of the fall, that the sin... The sin of Satan, his pride, his independence of God, which leads to absolute horrific consequences, is inside of all of us. Not just the susceptibility to sin, but sin itself infects all of us. It was not the horror of the man Eichmann that smote Denur. It was the horrible revelation of self and the predicament that he and all of mankind is in that made him faint on that television show. Eichmann 
is in all of us because all of us are in Adam. And this is proven every time we are susceptible to temptation. Now, here's what the Bible says. When we are tempted by theft, we are tempted because we are thieves, not because we've ever stolen anything. You don't ever have to steal anything to be a thief because the sin, the desire, the susceptibility is within all of us. Again, we are tempted to kill because we're murderers, even if we have never slain a person. The Lord said just our hatred that we have inside of us and our anger is enough. He says if you are angry with your brother without a cause, you are a murderer. How about this one? Jesus says we are tempted to adultery because we are adulterers, even though we may not commit it. When we think about it, when we look in a longing way, in a wrong, lustful way, he says you have committed adultery. That's why James says this in James 1, verses 13 and 14. When tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me, for God cannot be tempted with evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But listen, each one is tempted when, by his own evil desires, he is dragged away. The fall planted within all of us, the evil desires of Satan. Think for just a minute. Here's a a little graphic you can have in your mind. What's the middle letter of the word Lucifer? L-U-C-I-F-E-R. What's the middle letter of pride? P-R-I-D-E. What's the middle letter of sin? S-I-N. What's the biggest problem we're going to have our whole life? I want to do my own thing. I want to act independent of God. That's what James is talking about. In a very real way, each of us have within us the very same spiritual flaws that caused sin to come on Adam and Eve because we have inherited the same sin. This is how Jesus explained it. And I want to read to you what Christ said in John 8, 44. He said this when he was preaching. By the way, Jesus was not a popular preacher. I mean, by the end of his career, almost everyone stopped listening to him because he he was so convicting. This is an example of one of his sermons. He pointed at the people and he says, you are of your father, the devil. That's not winning friends and influencing people. You want to do the desires of your father. He told those religious, pompous Jews that they were, their father was not Abraham, their father was the devil. And he says... He was a murderer from the beginning. He doesn't stand the truth. There's no truth in him. And when he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own nature, for he's a liar and the father of lies. And he says, and when you sin, you're speaking from the same nature. Jesus says, you're like your father. You know what that means? When you and I were born into this world, we had an earthly father, but we also had a spiritual father. And we were born according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now works in all of us, children of disobedience. That's how we were born into this world, infected with the fallenness of Adam and Eve, the sin of Satan. So each of us was born into this world just like our father the devil, and that's the terrible reality of depravity. And we are sinners by nature, we are sinners by choice, and we are sinners by divine decree, and only Jesus, through the divine transformation of the new birth, can change all that. And that's what we preach. That's why we're supposed to share that news with everybody we meet. Because that's the good news. That the Eichmann, the Lucifer, the Satanists in each one of us, the, the, the susceptibility and the desire for evil, Jesus Christ conquered at the cross. And that's the blessing of salvation. Well, Satan doesn't want us to hear that. Satan is in an all-out attack to make you and me doubt, reject, and become deafened to the voice of God through his word. And when we're not listening to the voice of the Lord, we are thinking wrongly about God. When we are not filled with this book, when we do not think in biblical terms about the events and, and the different decisions we have to make in life, then we are operating independent of God. And when we operate independent of God, we're going our own way. And we're going the way of pride. And we lead toward disobedience and sin. Well, Adam and Eve, instead of following God obediently in paradise... They disobeyed, they fell into sin, and paradise was lost. You know, it's an interesting note if you study history. Do you know what the very first book published in America was? I was reading about it this week. It was the New England 
uh, primer, the primer, the, the little school book that New England used. And do you know what the first words are of that book? The first time that the type hit the paper and a book was printed in the new country, the United States of America, do you know what the first words that rolled out on that page were? I'll read them to you. In Adam's fall, we sinned all. That was a good start for our country. We've come a long way from that, haven't we? Well, let's read about it in Genesis chapter 3. I'm going to read the first nine verses. If you'd stand with me and remain standing until I have a word of prayer together with you. And let's look at the event. Let's look at the crash site. And then we're going to spend the rest of the morning sifting through the evidence. Follow along in your Bible, Genesis 3, the first nine verses. Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the tree of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die. For God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. And then the Lord God called to Adam, saying to him, Where art thou? Let's bow together. Lord, if we listen, we hear this morning your voice asking us, where are we? Satan wants us to not listen to you. He wants us to doubt your word. And when we avoid and neglect and don't follow your word, we're doubting it. We doubt that it's what we need for life. We disobey you because we don't think that we need it to live. I pray this morning that you would challenge us with whether or not we're doubting your word. I pray that you would reveal to us as your children where Satan's lies have begun to infect our lives. Whether actively we're doubting you or whether passively by neglect of your word we're doubting you. And at this special time as we're making many decisions for the new year, may we make a decision even today that we will not doubt your word that we will instead actively find your word more than our necessary food. And we will learn that it's not merely bread alone we live by, but by every word of God. Teach us that this morning. Help us to repent of doubting your word. And we'll ask for your blessing upon our study of your word. And Father, I pray for any this morning who have never yet even had their eyes open. They've never been turned from darkness to light. They've never been born again. That even through this teaching from your word, your spirit would convict them, and that in the privacy of their will, they would say yes to you, Lord Jesus, and confess their lostness and receive your salvation. We pray in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. And you may be seated. As you're seated, I want to remind you, that we saw last week in Isaiah 14, the fall of Satan. And we actually studied that for the last two weeks. And in that passage of Isaiah 14, 12 through 14, God's word confirms that it, would, it was indeed pride, the eye in Lucifer, the eye in pride, the eye in sin. It was that pride that caused Lucifer to want to compete with God and act independent of God. 
And acting independently from God is pride. And when we live our way, we are proud. And when we do the things the way we want to do them, instead of reflecting on God's way, that is the product of pride. Why do I say this? Because the first sin was pride. And every sin thereafter has been in some way an extension of that pride. And just as pride led the angel Lucifer to exalt himself above his creator and Lord, and because the bright star of the morning continually said, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will. That's why, in opposition to God's will, he was cast out of heaven. Because he said, I will be like God. God cast him out of his presence. So the original sin of Adam and Eve was pride. They trusted their own understanding above God's. That's what we see in verses 6 and 7 of chapter 3. They said, hmm, if we can get an understanding to know something God hasn't revealed to us, and if we can do that by disobeying, we are willing to do that. Because of that proud disobedience, God casts them out of the garden. You know, the Bible talks a lot about pride. I just want to show you a couple. Look for just a minute in Proverbs. Uh, Don't lose Genesis. We're going to be right back there in just a second. But if you go right to the middle of your Bible to the book of Psalms, the very next book to the right is the book of Proverbs. And I want to show you just three verses in Proverbs. Uh, Chapter 11 is the first one. Uh, The book of Proverbs is a theology of living. It tells how to live everyday life. One of five books, the wisdom books, uh, theology of suffering in Job, theology of worship in Psalms, theology of living in Proverbs, a theology of life, kind of the big questions in Ecclesiastes, and a theology of love in uh, Song of Solomon. But we're right in the middle in Proverbs, chapter 11. This is what it says in the second verse. It says, when pride comes, then comes dishonor. Uh, When pride comes into relationships, dishonor comes. When pride comes into ministry, dishonor comes. When pride comes into my business practices, dishonor comes. When pride comes into the church, dishonor comes. When pride comes into the family, dishonor comes. All entrances of pride lead to dishonor. Now look at chapter 16, verse 18 of Proverbs. Here's another word from God, his inspired word. And it says in verse 18, pride goes before destruction, and a haughty spirit before a fall. Now, how many times have we seen this? We've seen uh, the child that is proudly riding a bicycle and not listening, and they're looking the wrong way, and they crash. That's how God looks on our life. He says, when you're proudly pedaling your own way, you're going to crash. And pride comes before destruction. And that internal haughty spirit is what leads to the fall in Satan and in us. Now look at chapter 21 of Proverbs, verse 4. And again, the Word of God says this, A haughty look, a proud heart, and the plowing of the wicked. Uh, Or a variant reading is the lamp of the wicked. What it's saying is everything of the wicked is tainted by sin. And pride, as it says, this haughty look and proud heart is at the center. That means a lost person, even when they look back at their work, they look back at it with pride that says, I did that apart from God. And God says, that is wickedness. Well, back to Genesis 3, because I want to underline this in your mind and look at the ramifications of what it means to doubt God's word. Every day, because of the fall, we face pride. It is the supreme temptation from Satan. Pride is at the heart of his evil nature, and therefore Satan wants to make sure we as believers are never entirely free from the temptation to pride. And we'll always be battling pride as long as we're on earth. That's just his bottom line kind of basic channel that that he pumps into us, his pride. The only protection against pride and our only source of humility is A proper view of God. And a proper view of God only comes through this book, through this revelation of God. It only comes through God's Word. This is the revealed will of God that we need to be immersing ourselves in. Now, if we were to distill this down, pride could be defined as the sin of competing with God. 
So pride is competing with God, competing with him for the control of my life, competing with him for the glory that I'm supposed to give him. I want some of it. It's competing with God. Therefore, humility could be defined as the virtue of submitting to God. And therefore, he gets the glory and he runs my life. So pride is the sin of competing with God. And humility is the virtue of submitting to God. You see, total different end of the spectrum. And he gets the glory when we submit. Well, how does pride come in our lives? What, what are some of the practical ways that Genesis 3 plays out? Let me just give you two examples. Satan disguises his wicked way of pride very well. He dresses it in many different wrappers. He, he wraps up pride in, in a lot of different ways. We may be tempted to be self-centered in our feelings. You want to do a little test? You have a little pride in your feelings? The actions of being hurt. Ever heard some, I'm hurt. The only thing that gets hurt on us is the big part of us that's sticking out. That's our pride. And it gets stepped on and trimmed and bent and wounded and hurt. Uh, the feeling of being aloof is pride. Of being divisive. Always being the one that comes in to divide people. Being arrogant. Thinking big stuff. Of being resentful. Of being bitter. That's self-centeredness and pride in our feelings. We can also be self-seeking in the way we live. That comes in the attitude of pride in our abilities. We think we do it the best. Pride in our possessions. Our stuff's the best. You ever met someone, everything they have is the best. It's just, it's sickening when you see pride in someone else, but we can't sense it in ourselves. We have pride in our education. We think we have the most. We have pride in our social status. Were you invited to that? We're always comparing we have pride in our appearance. We have pride in the power we can exert over others. Some people in the church even so go far as to be proud of their biblical knowledge or what religious accomplishments they've had. Well, just for a second, go back to Proverbs, okay, 15. I just want to show you three more because the Bible so powerfully speaks this. Proverbs 15:33. All the way through the Bible, God is calling us to humbly submit to him. Proverbs 15, 33 says, do you want to succeed? Then look at this, Proverbs 15, 33. Before honor comes humility. Okay, what's the way up? It's down. Look at chapter 22 and verse 4 of Proverbs. The reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches Honor and life. You know, what's amazing. We just recently got back from Israel. You look at the accomplishments of Herod. Herod built things that no one today could ever build. King Herod. You know, King Herod the Great. The Christmas Herod. He built stuff that is impossible to be built on this planet nowadays. Even with all of our cranes and engineers. We can't lift those rocks. We can't move them. What did he get? He got a place in hell. Because he was so vain and proud, he wouldn't humble himself to go down and find that baby and worship him. He was more content with building his mansions on earth than ever seeking the God of heaven. So you know what? His pride precluded him from life eternal. The reward of humility and the fear of the Lord are riches, honor, and life. Here's another one. Look at Proverbs 27, 2. One last one. It says this. Let another praise you and not your own mouth. A stranger and not your own lips. That's God's method. He said there's nothing wrong with getting honor. Just don't always be fishing for it. Don't always be trying to get it. Let another praise you and not your own mouth. Well, back to Genesis 3. Let's, let's look at our lives today. Because the key to God's blessing is humility. And if we humbly will look at his word, we'll learn something this morning. God has designed humility as the key ingredient to his blessings. Pride provokes conflicts with people. Pride breaks our communion. It hinders our fellowship with the Lord. Humility promotes harmony and makes joyous fellowship with God. Well, as we examine the crash site, now imagine that you're uh, you know, on those boats dragging the sonar and the metal detectors back and forth like they're doing Egypt Air Flight 990 right now in the ocean, or as they were the last few weeks. If we brought our detectors over Genesis chapter 3, the crash site, what would we find? Let's just look at the, the four 
lies that Satan gave to Eve that day. And, and if you haven't got them marked, I, I would mark them in your Bible because you know what? They're not going to change. And Satan's going to come the same way. And if you haven't noticed these, notice them this morning. And it'll date some of you because I started this, I just briefly touched on it, a year and a half ago in the Revelation series, and I wanted to spend a whole session on each of these, and I'm doing that right now. But you might have started this, but you might have missed them because I said them so quickly. But the crash site, as we sift through these verses, we can piece together the remains of the fall, and we can see just what lies Satan told. And if we can see those lies or those spiritual flaws, we can see how they can presently harm us today. Number one of Satan's four spiritual flaws, his lies. Verse one of Genesis three. The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said? Here, here's Satan's first goal. He wants us to doubt God's word. Okay, so you might, I have it written right in my Bible. Satan wants me to doubt God's word. Has God indeed said? What Satan wants for us to do is to doubt God. And if we doubt God, we doubt his word. Satan wants us to believe God's word is just like any other book. It's nice, it's helpful, it's not absolute. He wants us to question God's word. He wants us to avoid God's word. He wants us to neglect God's word. Whatever else it takes to get us out of regular contact with God. Now let me ask you. Do you doubt God's word? You say, absolutely not. I believe every word in this book. Do you read it? One of the passive ways we can doubt this book is just to not know about it. To say, oh, I don't like to read. Or I don't know very much about the Bible. And I don't understand it and all that. Those are part of Satan's lies to you. Anything it takes to keep you from this book. What's the second one of his lies? Let me just mark them for you. We're going to see these in the future. The end of verse 1. Look what he says. Has God indeed said, that's doubting God's word, you shall not eat, emphasis on eat, of every tree of the garden? Secondly, Satan wanted Eve to not only doubt God's word. Did God really say that? But number two, doubt God's goodness. Does God really not want you to eat that tree from that tree? I mean, could a good God withhold something from you? See, that's part of Satan's lie. Doubt the goodness of God. Satan wants us to doubt God's goodness. He wants us to believe that God is out of touch with our needs. That he messed up in how he made us. He means well, but he doesn't quite have everything under control. And that's a direct attack on the character of God. And one of the greatest truths about our God is the moral attribute of God we know as his goodness. We're going to study that more in the future. Thirdly, verse 4. Doubt God's word. Doubt God's goodness. Here's the third flaw or lie of Satan. Satan wants us to doubt God's authority. Look what he says in verse 4. Then the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. God is not in charge. You're not going to die. If God said you're going to die, you're not going to die. Doubt God's authority. We doubt God when we doubt his authority. Satan wants us to believe God is not in charge. He wants us to think we're in charge. He wants to think God doesn't care about our choices, that we're in charge. He wants to think that God won't make us accountable for our deeds, that we're in charge. Now, that's the whole lie of evolution. If you and I are just a bit of primordial soup, and we evolve because of an electrical discharge in some uh, amino acids that group together in some ancient seabed, then we certainly are not going to have to bodily stand in front of our Creator and tell Him how we lived our life and why we did what we did. And that's the idea, the lie of Satan, to doubt God's authority. And the final one is in verse 5. Satan wants us to doubt God's plan. This is what he said in verse 5. For God knows in the day you eat it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God. Now God says that we'll be like Him when we see Him as He is. But that's His plan. Satan says, you don't have to wait. You can do it right now. Just do what I say. You'll be like God. And he wants us to be in a hurry and to disobey and doubt God's plan. We doubt God when we doubt his plan. Satan wants us to believe there's a better way to immortality. There's an easier way to heaven. There's a quicker way to happiness. And again, this is an attack on the word of God, on the sufficiency of God's word, and the fact that God 
has shown us in this book his plan. The question is not, is God speaking? The question is, are you listening? Well, let's just go back and finish off the first one before we go this morning. Verse 1. Because I want to look at each of Satan's lies, his spiritual flaws, closely. And this morning, the only one we're going to cover is doubting God's word. And I want to ask you some questions. Satan says, has, verse 1, God indeed said? Now, let me, let me just mention this to you. If you have never read the whole Bible, how do you know what God has said? Have you ever thought about that? We live in such, I was telling the elders this week, I mean, just, just in the last few months, I've gotten 1,600 emails. I'm not talking about the junk ones. I'm talking about legitimate, real ones. And I mean, I get sometimes 50 a day. Do you know what that does? I'll run them out, the ones I want to buy. You see, I'll put them on the counter. And she'll say, did you read this? I said, no, I didn't read that. I couldn't possibly read all those things. And, and she'll look at them. She said, did you read that? I said, no, I didn't read that either. Do you know what? Our, our society does, there's so much out there that you can't possibly read all the newspapers. You can't possibly read. You can't take, there's too much stuff out there. Do you know what we've done? We treat this like email. We treat this like the paper. We treat this like, hey, we're on vacation. There's that big stack of papers that they threw while we were gone. We just throw them all away. We don't need to read all that stuff. This is not the same. This is God talking. And when God talks, you and I should listen. And we shouldn't just be like children that, that eat the, the center out of their slice of bread because they don't like the crust. That's how most people read the Bible. They go in here where they like it, and they leave the crust. What did your parents tell you when you are little? Eat it all, right? You know what God says? Eat it all. Have you ever read the whole Bible? Have you ever read every word of God? If you have not, you doubt God because it's not important enough for you to listen to Him. Well, how does Satan want us to doubt God? He wants us to believe the Bible is just like any other book. It's nice, it's helpful, it's not absolute. And if I don't know it, it doesn't matter. It does matter. And you should know it. That's what he's saying. And Satan wants us to question God's Word. Now, you know, we just had a recent experience. And uh, year after year, Bonnie said, you know, those are pecan trees. And when you're out there mowing up those leaves, you're sucking up all the pecans. Why don't you... Pick them up. And so the kids all went out with their little bags, and they picked up, and we got these big bags of pecans. So I said, well, what are you supposed to do with them? So we tried the hammer. You know, it just makes pancakes out of them. So we didn't do that. So we took them down to the place where they do something to them. They hit them on the, both sides and crack them, and then they stick them in another machine that blows them. And finally, you come out with pretty good stuff. So we did all that, and we were going to put them in baggies. So we asked the girls to do that. And they sat at the table with their big bowl of pecans, and all of a sudden we heard, ah! I thought someone had been shot. They found a worm. Did you know pecans have worms about that long? They're big, fat, white ones. I'll tell you what, there was an immediate abandonment of the pecan process. And it was only gloves and a bribe that got them back. To, 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 because, I mean, there were those big white worms. Do you know what happens when, when you look in your bowl of soup and there's a hair in it? Or you take a bite out of the sandwich and there's you know, a piece of plastic in it? What is it? It ruins the whole thing. When you doubt God's word, all Satan has to do is get you to find one hair in your soup. One worm in your pecans. You don't want it. That's the bottom line of his temptation. He wants us to question God's word. He wants us to say, oh, I'm not sure God's accurate on that. Oh, I'm not sure God's right about that science. I'm not sure that the history is recorded right. I'm not sure that God, like when I was in New England, I heard, I don't think God understood homosexuals because homosexuality is okay and the word of God is wrong to say it's not okay. That's questioning God. God is absolute and he speaks absolute truth. And his truth is is forever settled in heaven, and you and I hold it in our hands. But you say, I don't question God's word. Do you avoid God's word? That's part of doubting. If you can avoid this thing, then it doesn't matter whether you believe it or not. You don't even know what it says if you avoid it. And if you merely trust what everyone else says about it, you still don't know what God has said because you've never found out for yourself. And avoiding God's word is very dangerous. And finally, neglecting God's word. And I want to ask you this morning, is Satan's flaw showing up in your life this week? Are you doubting God's word is more important than anything else? Now, let's close 
with two verses. Turn to Matthew chapter 4. The Gospel by Matthew chapter 4. Okay? Fourth chapter of the New Testament. I'm going to show you one here and one in Revelation, and we'll be all done. Let me ask you this morning, is Satan's flaw showing up in your life this week? If I uh, could take God's camera and play on these screens the last 168 hours of your life and my life, would it show up that we are neglecting this book? Really. If all of us could sit and do a, a you know, fast forward through our life, would this book show up prominently on every page of our life in the last week? You say, oh, no, it was the holidays, you know, and... Okay, the last two weeks. Is this... Now you say, what do you mean? Well, look at Matthew chapter 4. What was Satan's first temptation to Christ? Do you remember? That, that's in Matthew 4. Jesus was led up, verse 1. Verse 2, he fasted 40 days. Verse 3, the tempter came to him and commanded him to seek earthly things first. That's what it was. It was a temptation to the desires of the flesh, to seek earthly things. He says, command these stones to be made bread. Use your power from God to, to make your earthly life more comfortable. A lust of the flesh. Now, is there anything wrong with eating bread? No. What's wrong is, Jesus addresses. Look at verse 4. Jesus answered that temptation and said, It is written, man shall not live merely by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of of God. You know what Jesus said? God's word is more important than eating. Okay, let's play the tape of the last week. Was God's word more important than eating? Did you forget to eat breakfast, lunch, and supper day after day after day? Yeah, if you have anorexia and you're in the hospital, you might have. Do normal people? No. Boy, stomach starts growling. Five minutes after breakfast. I mean, it growls until lunch. And then, oh, you know, you can't. And then lunch, you know, you can't wait till supper. And after that, dessert. I mean, that's the American way. You know what God says? He says, when you look at your life, the Word of God should be more important than your daily bread. You say, that is ridiculous. That is hokey. That is archaic. You know what the Bible says? The prophets wrote, your word is more than my necessary food. Thy word was found and I did eat them. That's Jeremiah 15, 16. And your word was unto me the joy and rejoicing in my heart. I find your word, Psalm 19, sweeter than honey. It is more than my daily bread, the Bible says. Well, the scriptures tell us that we doubt God's word when we question God, when we avoid his book, or when we just neglect this book. Let me ask you, is the news more important than God's Word? When you spend a day without being in this book, what you're saying is, I don't need God. I can make it without Him. I can make decisions without Him. I can make my plans without Him. I can face the temptations of life without Him. I can live without God. And you know what? Satan's plan is working. We, like Adam and Eve in the garden, doubt God when we neglect this book. What happens when we don't neglect it? Last verse, Revelation 1. Just the end of your Bible. Go all the way to the back flap and then come back to Revelation chapter 1. I just want to underline what God promises us in His Word. Verse 3. Blessed, Revelation 1, 3, is he who reads... And those who hear the words of this prophecy and keep those things which are written in it, for the time is near. Jesus says, the word of God is more important than my daily bread. We cannot live without every word of God. Without what? Every word of God. Don't be a kid eating the center of your bread and leaving the crust. Read the whole thing. And not just read it, but those who read who hear with their heart the Word of God and keep the things which are written in it. This is the revealed will of God. Are you listening? God's talking. To doubt or not to doubt, that's what we have to decide. <laughs>